evening everyone i think this is a good time to start my name is urvashi agrawal and i welcome you all on behalf of manopatra to books and copyright before we begin i would like to request you all to keep your mics on mute so that we can have a smooth session a uh, uh, smooth conduct of session now as you all know today is world intellectual property right day it it is uh, the aim of this day is to increase general awareness and understanding of ip the theme of world intellectual property day 2023 is women and ip and who better to talk about it than ms jaya bhattacharjee rose she has had an illustrious career in publishing she has been in the industry since 1990s she is also the co-founder of ace literary consulting and an associate professor at school of modern media studies upes dehradun i would also like to invite our moderator for the session ms disha dalmia legal editor manopatra over to you disha good evening everyone once again uh, welcome to the platform jaya it's really nice to have you i hope uh, what will unfold from here is going to be a very fruitful session not only for both of us but for everyone who has joined in so kindly today thank you urvashi and thank you disha um thank you to manu patra for inviting me to this webinar it is a very special day for all of us and especially for all of us engaged in the world of words you on the legal side me on the publishing side it is a very important day for all of us so thank you thank you for this uh, invitation jaya we started uh, with the session uh, i mean the topic was copyright as an ip it's it's a very vital it's a very vital intellectual property however it's not considered as such because of uh, non the non mandate on registration and especially in the publishing industry we've seen in the last few years how copyright issues have grown and how uh, there is more awareness and simultaneously which has led to more people uh, having issues or coming up with new ideas copyright is basically a mess So, someone like you who has obviously had this illustrious career in publishing, and I'm sure uh, you have had to deal with uh, copyright issues throughout. Uh, would you like to shed some light on what copyright is to a publisher or a publishing agency? Let's 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 start with that. Um, that's a very wide and opening salvo, Disha. So, um, let's hold your question for a little while. because i think what you are what you what you're wanting us to do is to get right into it but i think for the benefit of the audience over here which is a, a mixed demographic it would be advisable to do a quick uh, a sort of a re recap of copyright you know the, where did this concept arise from because um today we sort of bandy the term copyright around an ipr and you know but really we don't understand what is the what is at the core of it the essence of it and why it emerged and you know i mean to briefly to briefly put it together um you know copyright is something which has which could have emerged when writing emerged uh, hundreds and hundreds of years thousands of years ago but that never happened that never happened when did copyright emerge copyright emerged the whole concept of copyright emerged when um a printing and uh, etc became easier there was there were more um you know with the the printing press and the gutenberg's printing press etc which came into existence more and more copies of literature were being produced and here i use the word literature in as an umbrella term for all kinds of literature because really the first kinds of literature which were popular were uh trade manuals business manuals co for commerce and of course religious literature it was not literature for leisure as we know it today and which is what we will ultimately talk about but um it, it, so the whole concept of copyright came up with the stationers guild in brit in uh, britain in the 17th century led to the uh, led to the statute of anne in the 18th century 1708 and at that time they were offering licenses for 2 years which when 1708 became to 14 years 
there was a, there was a, always a monetary aspect to these. There was, you know, we, uh, if an author went to a printer, they would say, okay, we'll print, but when we sell, some of the royalties earned will re remain with us. So we will give the, the author the benefit of creating a tangible product from their IPR and their creativity, but we will keep the returns. And slowly copyright, the whole concept of copyright got in, enmeshed in this whole financial aspect. It grew and grew and grew, but maybe not in that way as it should, as it should have and as it did in the 19th century. 19th century was when with, with mechanization, with the industrial revolution, with the steam press, there was a boom in, in printing. There was a boom in right. reading. There was a boom in the reading public. There was a, and, and as, as is happening today, because technology has is again created another, uh, another burst, another flourish of uh, reproduction um, since the 19th century, we had a lot of authors on the scene. And we had authors creating books, creating literature for a, and, and selling them for a, for a price. They were producing them locally. And in some cases, because obviously in the Industrial Revolution, Victorian era, trade was increasing. Books also began to travel. Yes. They began to travel. And that is when, that is when writers like Charles Dickens, he was one of the first people. He was one of the first people to talk about and insist upon. He actually used phrases like asking for international copyright laws. He actually insisted. And, 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 oh, and he was a man who was very commercially astute. He was prolific. He used to write weekly uh, in household words, et cetera, et cetera. He used to control his uh, creative and his income and his finances. But to his horror, he discovered that he was being pirated. And there was no protection. He had no legal protection. And uh, in 1937, when he uh, published Pickwick Papers, in fact, he dedicated the book, he dedicated the novel to um, a parliamentarian who was al also, also advocating um, a copyright. He was advocating copyright. And the parliamentarian was Thomas Talford, who was campaigning for copyright legislation that would provide to the authors of this and succeeding generations and their descendants a permanent interest in their copyright of their works. Dickens wrote to Talford saying, many a widowed mother and orphan child will bear high testimony to the value of your labors. Look at the terminology, look at the words, awesome. value, labor. I mean, and, and today, and today, today we tend to romanticize this whole notion of authorship and creative yeah. output, etc. We, uh, we're talking about a hundred years ago, approximately. No, nearly two hundred years ago. Yeah. Oh, 1837. Wow. 1837. Right. Nearly two hundred years ago. Awesome. Then and 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 already they were talking because by then trade was happening. Books were traveling to America, to Australia, to and when he went on his U.S. tour in 1842, he discovered to his horror how much his books were being pirated. And he, he got into quite a bit of a, a skirmish with the media and all, and they were they were saying to him, "Why? How dare you speak in this way? How dare you talk about money and all of this and tut tut and all of that sort of thing?" Much, much in the same way that J.K. Rowling is facing today for giving a new lease of life to her Harry Potter series by uh, allowing the BBC TV uh, production to happen. People are saying, "How can she?" Well, why not? If yeah, you have drawn parallels from 200 years ago to something as com contemporary as something that happened around two to three weeks ago. For uh, those who are not aware, I mean, Harry Potter is now being uh, converted into a series. Uh, I mean, firstly, it was only books and movies. Now it's a series. So, uh, like Jaya said, it, she uh, J.K. Rowling is being trolled a lot online, and uh, there are there, there's media behind her which is uh, just not okay with this decision. However, this decision belongs to her. So, Jaya, please continue. No, yeah. exactly. What what my point is, and I'm coming to it to it is that authors need to recognize that their creativity, their intellectual property right is something which is tangible, not just because it takes on the form of a 3D product like a book, but right. it is something which 
today in today's day and age because we have so many formats can be economically exploited for the benefit of the author and why shouldn't it be precisely it's not a it's not a bad word economics is not a bad word if that is going to be your if that is going to be your sustenance and your livelihood as it is few authors can live by by their words right, right. so Absolutely. why not do this so coming back to the 19th century the the next time i mean in 1852 was another very important year because that was the first time an international treaty on copyright was signed between france yes. and belgium we st i mean this was unheard of and it allowed protection to authors so much so that in 1861 when victor hugo already riding high on the success of uh, the hunchback of notre dame uh, negotiated a deal with an upstart new publisher for 300000 francs which is nearly 4 million us dollars today wow. um uh, for the les misérables and 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 he said it he said this is my work i want to be paid up front in cash for as much as i've never earned before because this is my work and he and the publisher was an upstart 22 year 28 year old who had to take a bank loan much in the way venture capitalists today invest mm -hmm. for in uh, in a new startups right so so there was this very strange kind of patronage which was coming in in vogue which is happening even today this whole idea of venture capitalism into the creative uh, field or when vcs buying pop, uh, uh, important publishing houses or buying a stake in order to sell them further emerged in the 19th century with the trade with investment in shipping with investment in in op financial opportunities and here was victor hugo in france doing this so we we did this and next thing was in burn uh, with burn the burn convention which became important because for the first time 10 countries signed the burn convention today 181 countries signed and right. the burn convention is right. very important because it has laid down the rules of copyright it says that every author can have the right to the copyright the copyright life is lifetime of the author plus copyright now if the burn convention can state it and all signatories to it have to uh, uh, adhere right. to it all authors need to know it and this is something which in the 21st century a lot of authors one finds uh, they falter they falter because they cannot tell the difference between assigning a license or uh, assi right, uh, assigning a contract for copyright life copyright life is important because at the at the basis of it is a monetary basis it has a <coughs> it has it has monetary uh, repercussions for everyone invested Absolutely. in producing the book it is important and this is exactly why when you say when you uh, uh, allocate the title as copyright is a vital yet overlooked part of a public uh, of of publishing a book it is because a lot of people do not understand the significance of it they're so eager and and i don't blame them they are very eager to be creative they just want to get on with the job they don't want to get into these intricacies but they do not realize they do not realize how important it is because you know we've had interesting uh, cases 1938 we've had we've even had the subramanian bharati case which of course is nothing to do with the book industry but it is with songs with audio which finally the uh, it didn't it, the family no longer had the right to the copyright nor did the producer have the right to the copyright it had to be nationalized you know so that everyone could benefit from it so there are many aspects to copyright because who actually gains who owns who uh, right, earns right, right, right. that is the crux of it no, that's are, the crux of it absolutely now we've reached the point where i think all of us uh, were really aiming for that who does it really belong to how how is this done what about uh, the authors what about the publishers how is it done well, well everyone everyone comes together is it's isn't it a coming together of constructive spirits isn't it a con coming together of constructive strengths but how do you how do you do it you do it because you ultimately look to the author who germinates that idea right and in this case the author need not be somebody with literary fiction it could be somebody who is trade who is legal whatever it is it is your authorship and whether you go to a publisher or whether you self publish 
you need to be in control and you need to understand the authorship because it's only then can you can you uh, benefit from selling those rights further today in the 21st century content is is the what 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 con oil was and gold was earlier yes. you know if you are a good content creator uh, a good writer you can you can really mint and there are people who really mint they they are dedicated and focused but it is understanding that you you uh, you uh, you retain the copyright because copyright cannot be registered anywhere it I mean, is the spirit it can be registered but in india it is not mandatory so most no. people don't no I exactly mean, the cool thing in india if it's not uh, forced down on us we we just don't do it. So, and and give and given the boom in writing yes. given the boom in writing we don't really have a copyright office you know i mean there are other lands where there is a copyright uh, center there's copyright offices there <clears throat> there are ways in which authors can register for them you know themselves because if they register themselves then the copyright units the, these institutions take it upon themselves to follow through any licensing deal in in libraries etc <clears throat> and then they give it excuse me and then the royalties earned through those lending libraries or through um, are given to the publish, author yeah they give it to the author yes <clears throat> so it becomes another e income generating stream that's right. not the case here <clears throat> that's not the case here so instead what happens is so so what happens here is that you have to be protected you have to understand publishers prefer and you don't blame them it makes sense publishers prefer to have all copyright because it's easier to negotiate any deals coming their way based on the contents that they hold in their stable because they have the right to it so they can further deal with it <coughs> exactly because if they don't have the right then two things happen simultaneously one is the publishers a uh, interest begins to wane in the product or in the content that they have because their returns are not as profitable as they would be if right. they were contained or i mean they held all the rights secondly they can if they wish to and it has i know it's happened uh, uh, in the past they can go back to the author and say give us rights so that we can negotiate with a third party but that's complicated that's a lot of paperwork why not take all the rights up front and for the benefit of the author do it but jaya who uh, deal with authors day in and day out do you think authors are that uh, you know uh, okay with parting with their rights over their work it's it's their uh, work after all you know that's exactly disha what is the thing is that a lot of authors don't know this they actually sign mm -hmm. off their rights it's only either the very sharp or the very experienced writers who have begun to see these um who begin to read their contracts carefully or they uh, work with uh, agents they work with people who can uh, read it legally for them and protect their rights it's a fine balance to achieve for the even the agent because uh, you have to sort of it's it's a business deal ultimately of course it's all it's a business deal it is not something you can't be romantic about you can't be romantic about this Absolutely. you know this is money no it's money it's 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 creating an i it's con the conversion of an ipr into into hard cash and right. uh, there has to be a reason i mean and authors a, a lot of authors are um, are prolific but uh, being prolific doesn't necessarily notch up sales look there's a difference and when you don't notch up sales today everyone has caught on especially after the pandemic i mean earlier on 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 reputation etc you did grant contracts but now it's becoming a little more they becoming a little more uh, prudent financially prudent i would say okay about issuing contracts because you have to be careful on the returns you are you check the numbers If that's it is that happens previous... with awareness that can only happen with awareness yeah, um, especially because there's a boom in writing like you just mentioned 
um, how many authors are aware that they are supposed to get into these contracts, save their rights, have everything in place but once they approach a publisher or you know an agent or something. Are they really aware? No, they are not. I I don't no. think they are. I don't think they are because I've seen I've seen a range of I, I mean I've seen a range of contracts. Some authors, as I said, sign away for nicks for sign away copyright because they they're truly very eager to write. Right. They they're truly eager to write. They're truly I mean and in many cases you're just grateful that they've got a contract. In in many cases contracts don't even exist. Yes, that's, you know, that's what I was going talking about. That you know that there, there are more than uh, more than we would like. There are numbers which suggest that there are no contracts in place. Things are just happening haywire, and that's all because of lack of awareness, which is why we are here today. And and, and sorry to interrupt. In fact, in uh, the Azam, I mean, we, we may be conversing in 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 the English language, but when you're talking uh, authors and book contracts and you're talking translations. It's incredible how much paperwork is involved in ensuring that the rights holders' uh, deeds are clear, everything is clear, because the monetary compensation which has to follow once other contracts are signed, you have to know how it's streamlined. You have to see how it works, because otherwise, uh, you know, it becomes very difficult. Look at that recent Mara judgment in Maharashtra. Yes, the Mumbai uh, judgment. Yeah, about Mira Ben's autobiography. They didn't, they, why did the gentleman go to the courts? Because he said that, you know, this book had been published in 1965 by Orient Longman, and after that, he hasn't been able to trace who's the rights holder. You know, yeah, so he had no other option. He had no other option. He had no other option. So finally, the courts granted him the license to uh, publish the translation in Marathi. But uh, with the caveat that the royalties need to be uh, deposited in the court as such time as the real, uh, right. you know, literary heir is identified. Right. So whoever, whoever the rights holder is, not necessarily the literary heir, but mm -hmm. the rights holder is identified. It's copyright is a very complicated concept. And authors, need, I, I mean, the whole reason of doing this webinar is, a, is, is part of the awareness situation. That yes. you have to understand that there is a there is the the monetary aspect is very closely aligned to the creative aspect, irrespective of what everyone may tell you, isn't it? Well, of course, of course, it is. So uh, I, I'd also like to shed some light on different aspects of copyright that we don't think about as much. I mean, there are lots of um, situations where famous books have been uh, copied and. Uh, you know, uh, situations have occurred where uh, laymen have simply taken something from a book, republished the same and uh, called it their own or, you know, derived something for that. Uh, do you have something in mind? Um, I think there's that uh, 1938 judgment, wasn't it, where they said that uh, the Gopal Das versus, uh, uh, versus Jagannath Prasad, who had said that they would be, you know, that the books were very similar, but finally they discovered that uh, Jagannath Prasad had actually plagiarized but like that you have many examples they keep coming up they keep coming up I mean you call them plagiarism or you call them whatever you like or you call them infringement copyright infringement or pay limitations or inspired of yeah, or whatever you and I know it's infringement because you are in the industry I am in a legal tech company we know these terms but there are people out there who do not even know these terms and they just know that uh, there is some sort of theft that has happened and uh, they, they don't know how to go about it. And uh, recently, apart from publishing as well, even in the, the OTT space, which has uh, grown exponentially, there have been just so many cases of, uh, you know, theft of manuscripts and all of that because, uh, uh, yes, we, every week there is a case where uh, some uh, odd person will claim that this uh, uh, particular OTT uh, release should be stopped because I own the rights to the original thing. And uh, there is just no end to this, it seems. However, there's also another type of copyright problem, which is uh, inspirational. So there is another example of, uh, again, Harry Potter, which is the generation's favorite, that uh, a fan actually. Uh, took some inspiration from the Harry Potter books, okay, and created their own lexicon and tried to publish it. Now, what does this mean? I am a Harry Potter fan. I have used these books 
and i am using all those uh, spells and all of that and creating a dictionary or a lexicon of my own and i'm trying to sell it now i can sell it to harry potter enthusiasts i am one so i know that uh, i would be ready to buy that so would so many of my friends without realizing the fact that this person has actually infringed the copyright of rolling because they sim they did what they simply copied from those seven books and entered it into a different base so whatever added a few page here and there and did what how is how is rolling uh, you know benefiting from this no way and this fan has now come up with a new thing and can obviously earn riches because let's be realistic harry potter is a huge franchise yeah and and and, and no and and listen it's a franchise because uh, rowling is is a sharp businesswoman right. she is one author who has always negotiated her deals and is very aware that there is potential in this whether she created pottermore or whether i mean she was one of the first people to create pottermore which right. was a website for ebooks etc it was a clunky website when she first launched it today it's got all the razmataz and it's got she, <laughs> she keeps up with it you know she's really in with all the generations to it's more than 25 years which is a generational lifespan since she started publishing she's she's smart and th this is not to say that just because she's a billionaire is today that she can afford to do this no there are many people out there who can do it right. and i've i've seen i have the brains to do it that's that's the thing yeah no and i have seen i i mean i i i have seen authors whom uh, when i tried writing about them or saying that their names and voices to be looked out for in in the coming year th their names would be edited out of the newspaper articles but today they are leading lights in india etc because i could see the potential i could see it but and now when you talk to those very same authors and they're commercially successful and they're getting into ott and they're getting into audio books and they're getting into digital formats and they're getting into print they're doing everything and the first thing they say is it's practical to know what to write it is practical to know your audience it is practical to do an outreach and it is practical to uh, to see where your revenue is coming from what is the whole em emphasis on practical right practical means that there has to be an roi on your returns unfortunately creativity is a lovely space to be in and it gives all of us satisfaction i would love it if i could just spend my days reading in and out but you know it's important to engage just as i would love to be a reader um a uh, uh, writers just love to write but you also mm. need to be aware of the real world and today 21st century when the content uh, 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 boom is taking place that is one reason why we have an explosion of writers because everyone thinks that they can write right yes but that's not the case that's the harsh reality <laughs> <coughs> it's a harsh reality the reason why i gave the dickens dickensian example was 200 years ago when there was a technological revolution as has happened today in the 21st century with digital there is this reality we have to face i mean i can get into all the intricacies of ebooks and all the doj and all yes. which we will no, not but everything that uh, you must also have to go through but there is just so many aspects to it there are so many aspects and a lot of the times people just sign saying oh subsidiary rights forget it but if you actually manage subsidiary rights and you manage everything it works right, right. it works uh, again if because we have been talking about rowling go back to rowling she's a superstar in literature she's a superstar but like her okay she's she's in the stratosphere but like her i have seen other writers that their fortunes transform within weeks and months it may not be absolutely visible like they like a movie star but i can see the returns happening in the way readers are reaching out to them and the impact that they have done the impact factor is important mm -hmm. you know and the impact factor is a combination of sales as well as um as well as uh, their literature and and this whole thing about being aware of copyright is important because when you have copyright infringement or when you when others say that they've been inspired by it you need to know how to draw the lines and say no 
No, because, and why will people get influenced and be inspirational? Because there's a monetary return. Yes, of but, course. Jaya, but, but, uh, okay, sorry, please continue. So one last thing, but you have to say that the fan fiction sites which exist are in a slightly different game. <laughs> That's inspirational of a different kind and they uh, work in a different way. Now, tell me. No, just to just to continue with the discussion, um, how how many? I mean, have you really dealt with uh, situations where, uh, where through your agency you've come across uh, copyright infringement or uh, issues which uh, uh, authors have come to you with regarding copyright? Or are you, you careful? Okay, as an agent, are you careful while uh, drafting a contract or just looking through it? Because how how essential do you think it's uh, it is for a contract to contain these clauses and uh, uh, you know really understand copyright for an author? Oh, I'm very careful on that. I'm very careful on that because I because after all, a contract uh, enshrines the conversations and negotiations which have already taken place in the preliminary discussions. So you need to be careful. You know, you need to be careful and you need to see that the contract embodies the spirit of the conversations which have already taken prior to actually sharing the draft contract right. and you need to protect the rights of the author as well so a big takeaway for anyone who's attending this and is a potential writer or is a writer uh, right now it's uh, existing as well is that it's important to read your contract it's, it's it's essential to understand who has those rights where those rights are going and what what after five years have you given those rights to somebody else just for the for the sake of it because it's it's very easy for a for a starter to you know um, extinguish their rights thinking that uh, we are we're just dealing with a book here let me just get published my publisher will take care of things and all of that but it's it's essential to understand that copyright is yours and infringement can happen in any way like you mentioned uh, the fan club thing or the cases that we just spoke about there are tons and tons of examples where infringement has occurred for that matter. The, there are obviously the high courts, the Supreme Court, everyone, everywhere, it's it's filled with cases of copyright infringement. And it could uh, be anything from uh, a, a, a few pages which have been copied. And uh, all of these things are left to the benefit of, uh, of doubt or, you know, how far do people can go when it comes to actually protecting their copyright? Because infringement cases are one too many. And of course, like we began, uh, since it's not a mandate to register the same, there are more and more issues coming because of it. Yeah, because see, infringement <laughs> of, infringement happens also. I mean, one is, of course, on the on technicals, you don't, it's not mandatory to register the copyright to a document. But secondly, um, infringement also happens when you talk about ethics, right? I mean, um, uh, what are the ethics involved in it? For instance, now this is nothing to do with books, but it is something which may resonate with a lot of the audience here, is when, you know, you, everyone knows that Sylvester Stallone wrote, wrote Rock, the Rocky films, right? right. And he was, in, he, was in, he was in abject poverty when he wrote them and then he became, I mean, it, it, the first Rocky went on to get what, nominated for nine Oscars, won a multitude of them and oh, it was well, okay. huge, yeah. But three Rockies on, somebody came to him and said, oh, hey, inspired by your Rocky uh, series, I have written a bunch of stories and pitched them to Stallone. Stallone uh, dismissed it, had nothing to do with it. When Rocky IV came out, there were li little kernels of those stories visible, including wow. some character. So the storyteller who had come to Stallone went to the courts and said, Stallone had infringed my copyright. Yes, of course. So, I mean, that is what we're talking about. No. That, no, no, I'm not justifying the claim. I'm just saying that it's so easy to put such a claim on someone known or something. And that's where exactly. the book started right now. Exactly. But the, but the courts ruled in Stallone's favor saying, how can it be an infringement when you infringe in the first place by creating a whole bunch of inspirational stories taken from what was Stallone's own story. Yes, absolutely. So, so it's not, it's an infringement of an infringement which negates the whole thing and the verdict was in the favor of Stallone. 
so you know these the whole concept of copyright is also is is fundamentally based on ethics of course it is it is on the operation it's on it's, i mean the whole idea of moral rights which was as ascribed soon as to you take the mandate out of anything it becomes about ethics anyway yeah it, it's, it's, it's not ethical to copy someone else's work however uh, it may be for the same with harry potter example maybe the maybe the fan was coming from a uh, from a good place that you know what i love these books let's just try and make it easier for the rest of the people let's make it better for the harry potter fans but does your you know uh, positive mind or your uh, right intentions actually absolve you of whatever wrong you're doing no because drawling had rights in it yeah well you know i mean we can have a long uh, drawn conversation on copyright because it actually it's a, it's it's like it's it's a it's a pandora's box of it's a, it, it's constantly <laughs> evolving there are many formats many ways in which the content can be exploited for economic returns what is ethical use of it what is fair use of copyrighted material what is creative commons how much can you allow it to be used for the benefit of others how many people can actually afford to read licensed copyrighted work because if you see licensed materials which exist uh, based uh, you know which have which create a longer tail for literary estates not many people can really afford to buy those individual product lines of and course. yet and yet there are entire verticals which now exist in publishing houses of very popular writers long dead and gone whose rights are being exploited yes why is still in the copyright quite space common. this is quite common actually yeah i mean so the reason why our copyright life in india was extended by 10 years to 60 after the death lifetime of the author was because of the rabindranath tagore uh, yes. copyright absolutely absolutely so i mean so and, and again when you talk about it ethically this is business ethics right why not exploit them but the fact is that even an upcoming author or an uh, or a established author needs to recognize what copyright means to them they cannot capitulate at the end thaw because these are conversations and negotiations which can become a little messy of course they can be especially because there are uh, multiple variables involved yeah, no and, and and more than multiple variables disha it is hard cash which is involved right and 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 uh, and and uh, the thing is that it, it ultimately it depends upon the popularity of the writer based upon the reader response that is why when the conver the conversion of self published authors into mega writers with branded publishing houses happens it happens because they have actually been through the litmus test with the reading public right you know look at the look at the person who wrote 50 shades of gray self published right. books all self published but the digital boom enabled the publishing to happen on the kindle uh, uh, the publisher penguin random house in new york picked it up okay they um, gave the author finally got a branded publisher the right. first year of sales was so magnificent that everyone in the new york office got a 5000 dollar christmas bonus you know i mean so of course it's a different matter that subsequently the biggest pile of books deposited in uh, second hand stores or charity stores were the 50 shades of gray series that's a different matter because <laughs> people are fed up with it but but it, these things happen copyright is possible right it is possible uh, another issue that comes up is that since it's not mandatory as usual we go back to the point how do i tell the court that you know uh this guy has uh, stolen this from from me how did the stallone example that you gave it's it's very tough it's very it's important to understand and that's why it's important to have your <clears throat> clauses and contracts in place because uh to prove that you own the copyright in a court of law is also a challenge going back to the 19 1938 example that you just gave uh the court was partly convinced that uh, you know the, the the latter book was a bit of a copy of the old one however the arguments that were made by the latter author were that you know maybe our sources were the same it's the most uh, simple thing to do just say that uh, oh we use the same bibliography 
uh, it's just a random topic maybe we were researching through the same things however one of the key things that happened in that case was that the judge recognized a typing error a typo something that is so yeah. that is just so blatant i mean if if i am doing that and if you are copying the same it it's like how it used to happen in school if i make the mistake and my friend also copies it's the same thing so that is where the judge drew the line that uh, okay you are saying same source and all of that but a typo is not something you can justify that means you have absolutely lifted text from the older book have given it a new face in the new book and just added a few random pages here and there can you really justify that so enforcement is a problem this guy uh, unfortunately could not pro prove his point because the typo uh, surfaced but what otherwise it's it's a it's a tough job it's it's very tough to actually uh, fight for your infringement uh, or you know, defend your yeah just to continue Ajay, also uh, another challenge that people face in same way in Stallone the uh, the other guy he was not a big deal he would always be scared of taking up a Stallone same with OTTs I mean a small person who may have just uh, you know approached a director or something or just narrated his story will face issues or will think twice before actually going to the court because things can be manipulated. But apart from that, even otherwise, it's very difficult to prove that yes, you own this, you have actually built it, you have germinated this and no, the other person has actually uh, lifted this off to build that connection, that, um, uh, that connection of actually withdrawing from those texts. So this is, this is a very, like you said, we can just keep on talking about this, but this is a big mess. No, but, but you know, quickly before we take to the questions, the thing is that you can prove your copyright if you've been the original creator, you have your notes, right? You have your drafts, but, but the documentation, you're right. The, the proving and putting forth that documentation to prove that this is your original work and creative work is a time consuming task. Of but course it, is, it is important to do it if you want to preserve your rights. Absolutely. And that's why and, first step, just get your contracts in place. Yeah, and you have to do it. You have to do it if you're ready to fight for it. Because I have noticed one of the things when in, in, in response to the question you asked me earlier, a lot of people get shy away from the messy conversations that can occur when you're dealing with uh, negotiating copyright and rights. Yes, yes, absolutely. It, I mean, they can get, uh, forget <laughs> messy. Let's just call them ugly sometimes. They are. And, uh, they, and, 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 and I have seen people shrivel up and walk away and say, no, 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 no. Let it be status quo. And I'm like, don't do it. This is not, this is not right to be status quo. See it through the bitter end because trust me, this is baptism by fire. It will work. Because one of the things is, that uh, in the 21st century, things are evolving so rapidly, so rapidly that it is really through osmosis and through keeping up with our information and reading and, and connections that we know that it is an ever evolving space. Of course. Contracts, contracts which are issued were drafted some months ago, some years ago. They, they, they are just like an older tradition one. Yeah, they're repeating them. Whereas, Whereas content today is moving at the same speed and uh, as a tech, a fintech or a technology company would would do it. They have lifespans of two, they're not lifespans. They have life cycles of two to three months of right. their projects. Publishing life cycles are 18 months to 24 months, right? But the contracts which are issued need to reflect more and more of the modern time in which they are signed. You cannot hark back to a contract. You cannot sign a contract today, which was actually the the kernel of was, what it was drafted even five, 10 years ago. It's outdated. You need to fight for those rights. Yeah, and like we said, uh, copyright uh, awareness has become so rampant right now, especially in the last half a decade. Let's not even say a decade ago. It's, it's only been in the last five years because of the boom of uh, writing, of OTT, of uh, COVID leading to all of this, that it's, it's more and more important to understand that every uh, contract that you now enter into should be accordingly, uh, according to what you're actually writing. 
and uh, not something that you can just pass off from six years ago, seven years ago, or something like that. No, you can't do that, and you have to change. <coughs> in fact, you have to uh, review contracts. Um, you know, especially, but you can only review them if you have uh, if you have accorded the license and not signed up signed away for the copyright life. Then that becomes hard. That's that's impossible. And that you suggestions I would genuinely give is just you know just register the copyright. It's not a big process. I know with again until unless we are forced to, we don't do things uh, here. But uh, I recently had the opportunity to actually file a copyright, and it was a very simple process. The yeah. registry is great. I mean, the the process was very smooth. They just ask you for your documents, the supporting ones. I mean, it's just absolving you of a lot of things. And uh, any future uh, problems that may occur if you have your copyright set in place. And why not? When, when you have the registry, when you have these uh, facilities, especially now that IP, thanks to WIPO and these uh, IP days and all of that, there's just so much awareness that, that it's important to inculcate the habit of registering. Because you may keep on defending yourself that, uh, no, I own this, I own that. But at the end of the day, you don't... How many notes can you can you take? How but much? How far can you go? I suspect that hesitation comes from a from a lack of knowledge and awareness that these copyright registries exist. Secondly, there is this because you romanticize the notion of the world of words. You think that this is far too much labor for something which will give you least cost returns, least returns. Whereas if you no one thinks twice about registering a patent. Right? Or, a or, doing a, or, or a trademark. Trade. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I was just coming to that. A patent yeah. and a trademark in everyone's mind is considered to be more financially lucrative than the world of words. Whereas yet they're ready to fight tooth and nail to assert their rights when it comes into the publishing domain. Absolutely. Someone just wrote in the chat about the Chetan Bhagat and Three Idiots uh, movie fiasco on copyright. This is exactly what you're talking about that people don't think. <laughs> on how it would be and uh, exactly exactly no. registered i mean people just start registering as soon as they think of something when it comes to trademarks patent is also a long run process let's just leave that for now but for copyright it's it's important and it's it's actually to understand that it's time we start registering exactly no but you know like like let's take some of the questions and if anyone wants to raise ask questions they should raise their hands because you know there is this thing. There's a, somebody's asked uh, that a self-published author asserts his or her copyrights. How can an author? Inform? I mean, this is something that this is goes into the legal domain. We are not here to give legal advice, but this, uh, the same thing that you need to be aware. You need to, as Disha was already uh, 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 listing, that you need to, uh, you know, confirm that this copyright belongs to you, and maybe uh, you know, take it, maybe assert it maybe confirm it and then you can take it forward into any other platform. And, right. uh, you know, I mean, and this holds true for, you know, in, in a lot of contracts I've seen, you automatically put in a clause saying also, who is the legal heir? Because th there is no nothing wrong in thinking about life after the, uh, the death of the author. Uh, it's important because yeah. once, once things get over or something, um, the, if you don't have any provision for it, um, we could go back to the Bombay High Court judgment. There is no trace of who the rights for the book belong to. So that person who wants to, you know, translate and everything is running helter skelter. While if there was a contract in place, if there were provisions in place that who has rights when and where, things would have been smoother for everyone for that matter. Exactly, exactly. So, um, Disha, do you want to open the floor to con uh, questions? Or, so that I think I saw somebody put up a hand earlier in, in the thing. No problem. I, although I do have a problem with uh, people asking legal questions because we are not going to. No, get... we're not asking, we're not taking legal questions. We're just asking yeah. about copyright and, uh, and, and other things, you know, in terms of. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, and you know general awareness when it comes to copyright and publishing and everything because a lot of questions that we received uh, while we were getting registrations were also surrounded on copyright and to be honest with you as a lawyer it's best to consult an expert when it comes to any field we are here to spread awareness and uh, 
that that's that that was the idea here and uh, to give um, advice would not be uh, right so anyone who has any question that we can take up no, well. we, we are not here to give advice because um, uh, because um, uh, because the thing is that we need to understand that copyright is especially now yeah. more than in the previous centuries is evolving so fast is evolving so fast that you really 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 need to um uh, uh, you really need to have work with experts and you need and also you need to not be a bit an expert with a lawyer etc but because it is the spirit and the ethics of it which need to be discussed and enshrined in the contract as for the future uh, for the future you know right. um Somebody is asking about how to protect ourselves from copyright infringement on terms of owner of curriculum of workshop. I think it's the same thing. And we are not talking about legal counseling here, Meher. I think it is the same thing as talking about any literary, I mean, literary output. If this is original, uh, if it is original exactly. content and work course workshop, um, as Disha has already said, re register it, register it and, and do it, you know um but beyond that i don't think there's anything else you can do because workshops etc work on the premise that there is a certain amount of content which is similar and you you actually use already published contract content and right. then create your own personal touch isn't that it disha yes isn't yes. that how it is done accumulation <laughs> uh, when it comes to workshops or uh, sessions for that matter it's accumulation of course we cited so many cases while just talking about copyright and publishing in general so and, uh, and also and also in a lot of cases we only touched upon it but in work, workshops is a fine example but as in teaching material academic material there is the whole concept of fair use of copyrighted material right that's a completely different legal it's domain different when it comes to copyright fair use goes hand in hand and it's important to understand for whoever here is dealing with copyrights or is interested in publishing and all it's important to know what fair use means, how much of it is allowed. Uh, it's, it's again, it's best to consult an expert. Uh, someone here has uh, asked about enforced internationally. Again, not here to give uh, uh, legal advice, but it would be great if you could uh, ask someone who is in the domain. It's best if we just talk to people who are expert in their fields and, you know, they, they, they can better guide. If I had a publishing related question, I would shoot them at Jaya. And, and not to my friend who is a lawyer, because I know that you are an expert when it comes to the business of publishing. So it's it's best to do it that way. Yeah, it's it's best. Um, any other questions? Any other questions? Uh, Existing. Yeah, can I can I ask one question? There's a, just to remain that there's a question in the chat box. Uh, what is this? Uh, do you think that existing copyright is well protecting its authors? This is legal. I mean, this is not something which we can discuss over here. This is not the scope <laughs> of this conversation. What is copyright? How to do things? That that can be a separate uh, session uh, altogether. Session. Yeah, Ravinder, yeah, you had a question. Go ahead quickly. So some of my stories have been uh, published in textbooks, okay. uh, and the publisher uh, publishers are quite uh, reputed, famous, popular. And they have not taken any permission from me. I just, by serendipity, ran into these uh, stories. So, in this kind of a situation, what is to be done? Disha, this is, yeah. That's illegal. That's illegal. I'm, I'm going to deal with this. Don't worry, Jaha. And then I'm, so, I'm sorry to hear that. Firstly, but secondly, that this is not where I can advise you as a as a legal person because, like I said, it's best to deal with some um, take this query to someone who can help you actually in uh, your copyright queries because this is just an awareness uh, session and uh, and seriously, there my, that that, there's definitely something that can be done. Like we said, if you already know that something wrong is happening and you know where and what where it is channeled so it's best to seek advice because they can actually help you afterwards as well if you need to go to the court they'll take you if if they think that something can be worked out otherwise it would be best to consult the right person for this yeah and and, and you have to think it through before you actually um, take these steps because as as uh, disha and uh, urvashir already pointed out there are multiple factors it's not just it's not as straightforward as content and monetary 
and but it's also due acknowledgement and a whole lot of other sets of factors which are at play here. And you have to evaluate and see whether it's worth your while to go ahead or get or in, in future get that due acknowledgement in some way or the other. Yes. So that's the thing. Any uh, further, uh, Disha? Jay, I think this is a good time to, to uh, uh, wrap this, this up. up. Whether a, okay, we'll just take this. Whether a PhD thesis is required to be registered yes. under, there is no requirement. That is what we uh, try to harp on in the session that copyright need not be registered as such. And uh, I think we're just getting more and more uh, legal questions. What you can do is you can, um, Urvashi will be sending out, we will be sending out a feedback, feedback form. form yeah. And uh, if there's anything that you would like to know more, we, you can just write in, in those forms. Maybe we could have another session about, uh, which is more technical and more legal in right. approach. Then you can have your, all of your legal queries answered. I can clearly tell that this is a much demanded session. <laughs> <laughs> I totally do a more technical session about uh, IPR and copyright in uh, particular. So. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was Thank lovely you. to hear you. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Yeah. No, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.